announcements. First of all, I've heard there's an ice storm coming. <laughs> now, I think we took care of that this year. <laughs> Would you uh, please all remember to turn off or silence your cell phones or put them on vibrate? Second, immediately following the presidential address, you are all invited to attend the president's reception, which will be held outside on the Sunset Terrace, which is directly out those doors. There will be hors d'oeuvres and a cash bar. Please join us as we honor Arlette Willis's service to LRA over the past year and all of our past presidents. Later tonight, from 9 o'clock until midnight, we invite you to attend back is vital issues. It's backed by popular demand and it has been revitalized and hosted by the Field Council. So we thank Jennifer Powell and the Field Council for organizing it. Uh, it will meet in Corals with a K in, on the lobby level, which is the lobby lounge. Also, if you didn't notice today, there are grab and go food items available for purchase throughout the hotel from seven in the morning until three in the afternoon. If you wanna just grab something and take it um, for breakfast or lunch, you're welcome to find those stations. If you haven't had an opportunity to um, visit the Chicky Huts, <laughs> they are just a short distance from here. You would just go out the uh, back of the hotel toward the beach. And there are sessions in Chicky Huts 16, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. There was a little bit of an incident on the beach today. We have taken care of that incident so that you, what you need to know is that those huts are, are LRAs for the entire duration. If there's not a session in there, you are welcome to use them. They are for, for our members to use. So please feel free to use those chicky huts. Also, um, be careful. I've heard, I've not had experience with this, but if you have food out there, I've heard particularly the pizzas, or if you wave a sandwich in the air, I don't know why you would do that. Be, be careful, there are many birds that are apparently very hungry. Uh, I also need to let you know that the publishers are downstairs on the lower level in the Capri Hall foyer, uh, where all of the Capri sessions are. As well, if you haven't find, found the silent book auction yet, if you keep going on that lower level around the Capri ballrooms, there is Collier Hall and all of the silent auction books are down there. And if you're looking for a printer, there is a laptop and a printer down there. You are, it is yours to use. Just print away or you can bring your own laptop. It is free. Also, uh, conference papers can be downloaded using the link that you uh, received yesterday. If you have forgotten, you can also upload your papers there. Uh, and as well, please remember to bring a copy of Yetta Goodman's Oscar Causey plenary address handout with you tomorrow at 1030 for her session. Now, I, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce the J. Michael Parker Award presentation, the Student Outstanding Award presentation, and the introduction of the Star Fellows and Mentors. Just prior to the J. Michael Parker Award, I would like to um, acknowledge the, <laughs> sorry, Sylvia. The board would like to acknowledge the generous bequest of Trika Smith Burke on behalf of the J. Michael Parker Award. And it is now my pleasure to introduce the chair of the J. Michael Parker Award Committee, Sylvia Nguyen Liu. Hello. Um, the J. Michael Parker Award recognizes contributions to adult literacy research. It was established in 2001 in honor of J. M. Michael Parker, winner of the Student Outstanding Research Award. We want to acknowledge, just like Jenny said, the support of Trika Smith uh, work, whose legacy in adult literacy includes her unwavering dedication to young scholars in this field. I also want to recognize the members of the award committee, and I ask that they stand if they're here. Tisha Lewis Ellison, Leah Saul, Debbie East, Carol Delaney, and Jennifer Hathaway. Thank you for your support. <laughs> and with a paper entitled The Vocabulary Notebook as a Vehicle for Independent Vocabulary Learning for Community College ELLs, please welcome the recipient of this year's award, 
Dr. Diane Tavejia. Well, um, thank you to Sylvia and the J. Michael Parker Award Committee. Um, I can't say that I'm uh, not utterly tickled to receive this award. Um, I am also uh, grateful to the Literacy Research Association for this wonderful opportunity to share my research and. Um, and hear all about yours. This is my first time ever at this conference, and it's, it's um, phew, my mind has been enriched today, let's just say. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to my uh, colleague instructor who allowed me graciously into her classroom for one tough semester and the students that I met there while I did my research. Um, it was a wonderful experience. And finally, um, I have a big debt of gratitude to my committee at KU, um, most especially Dr. Bradley, my chair, as well as Danita Shaw, who may or may not be here. Um, anyway, thank you very much, and uh, I um, hope you all have a great conference. Bye-bye. Congratulations, Diane, and thank you, Sylvia, and your committee for all of your hard work. It's now my pleasure to introduce Kathy Compton Lilly from the University of Wisconsin Madison, who is chair of the Student Outstanding Research Award Committee. Thank you. I am thrilled to be able to present the 2014 Student Outstanding Research Award. Um, this year's paper was selected from a particularly competitive set of submissions, so it uh, left our committee with a very difficult task. You saw all their names um, scrolling up here a minute ago, so I thank my committee very, very much. That We worked very hard, and it was a very difficult decision to make. Um, I'm pleased to present the 2014 Student Outstanding Research Award to Jay Teal, an emerging scholar at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Dr. Teal's paper, The Role of Objects in the Construction of Young Children's Literacies, is not only an important contribution to our understandings of how children construct meaning, but it is also a beautifully written piece that is certain to be a wonderful contribution to the LRA yearbook. Dr. Teal is speaking tomorrow morning about superhero play and embodied literacies, tomorrow afternoon on um, embodied literacies and community-based research, and one last time on Friday morning on the role of objects in children's literacy practices. So be sure to catch one of these great talks. Finally, I welcome all interested graduate students to join us on Saturday morning for a session on preparing and submitting a paper for the Student Outstanding Research Award competition. So please come and bring your questions and issues. Congratulations, Dr. Teal. Thank you. Um, when I was told I would have a few minutes to speak while accepting this award, I realized that it would take a lifetime to show my gratitude to those who played a significant role in my academic trajectory by helping me become an academic that is capable of writing a paper that could receive an award like this one. But since I only have a few minutes, I do I want to publicly recognize a few people. Certainly, my hard work has been doused in serendipity and hard work and dedication of others, such as my spouse, who might as well have had an honorary PhD for all the extra time he spent reading drafts and listening to me go on and on and on about philosophy and theory. I also consider myself lucky to have the support and encouragement of my mentors, specifically Mark Vogley, who taught me that I was a philosopher all along 
and my dissertation chair, Stephanie Jones, who was the first person to show me that my working class roots are just as valid and important as anyone else's. I'm also thankful to the committee who recognized this work as an important contribution to the field of literacy. And with this award acknowledges that the intellectual lives of the children in my study are crucial to educational equity and pedagogical change. This leads me to the last person that I would like to publicly thank, my mother. When I started school, my mom received a note in the beginning weeks that said, Jay is ready to read and write. This is causing her to disturb the class. Can you please make her behave? <laughs> Those of us in this room have read and are conducted enough research to know that a girl growing up in a working class family that is labeled as a troublemaker in her first weeks of school often faces a very difficult educational trajectory. But the next day, my mother, a woman who has a very complicated and often painful history with the institution of school, gave me the most precious gift that she has ever given me. My mother walked into that building and demanded that I be placed into a classroom where my insatiable need for traditional literacies would be fostered and celebrated. Her courage and love afforded me the opportunity to be seen as possibility rather than problem. And there is no doubt in my mind that my mother's actions that day fostered my unbridled love for learning and thinking within the context of traditional schools. Ultimately, there is no words to express what these people and many others have meant to me along the way. So instead of trying to verbally thank them again and again, I leave them with a promise to always pay it forward, to be the mentor, the mother, the teacher, the researcher, and human being that you all were and continue to be for me. Thank you. Congratulations, Jay, and thank you, Kathy, and your committee, again, for all of your very diligent work in reading all of those proposals. It's now my pleasure to introduce Marcel Haddix from Syracuse University, who is chair of the Ethnicity, Race, and Multilingualism Committee. Marcel. Good evening. So first, I'd like to thank President Arlette Willis and Vice President Janice Omasi for providing the space for me to present the STAR program to acknowledge the STAR fellows and mentors and the numerous people who are responsible uh, for the program and its existence. In 2008, the Ethnicity, Race, and Multilingualism Committee put forth a proposal to create a pipeline for promising emerging scholars of color who will continue the strong tradition of leadership, research, and service within our organization, and who will commit and dedicate themselves to addressing issues of racial, ethnic, and linguistic diversity within our organization and within the literacy field at large. One component of that proposal was the establishment of the STAR program, Scholars of Color Transitioning into Academic Research Institutions Mentoring Program. This is a selective program for scholars of color who are beginning their careers as literacy researchers. I want to acknowledge several people whose leadership made the STAR program possible. These individuals include past presidents Kathy Au and Patricia Edwards, the president and vice president at the time of the proposal, Kathy Hinchman and David, Dave Rankin, as well as the board of directors at that time. I'd also like to thank and ask to stand the former chairs of the ERM committee and first directors of the STAR program. The STAR director in 2009 and 2010, Jennifer Danridge Turner from the University of Maryland. <laughs> and STAR director from 2010 to 2012, Julia Lopez Robertson from the University of South Carolina. Thank you each for all of your work and leadership in paving the way for the STAR program and getting it where it is today. Since 2009, the STAR program has mentored four cohorts of emerging scholars of color. So I'd like to ask each STAR fellow and their mentor to stand as they are called and remain standing 
And I'd ask that everyone hold their applause until everyone is standing because I have a lot of names. So as some fellows have not yet arrived, um, their pictures will be prominently displayed above. So cohort one from 2009 to 2011, the first cohort included myself, Marcel Haddix from Syracuse University, and my mentor was Mark Conley, if he's here, please stand. Ying Guo, the University of Cincinnati, and her mentor was Lee Gunderson. Grace Enrique from Leslie University, whose mentor was Maria Franchi. The second cohort from 2010 to 2012 was Tisha Ellison from Georgia State, she's back there, Georgia State University, and mentor Gwendolyn McMillan. Simi Aziz from the University of Arizona, mentor Maria Franchi. Carol Brochin, University of Arizona, mentor was uh, Helen Abid Abidiano. And Yo Kong Song from University of New Mexico, mentor Kathy Al. The third cohort, 2011-2013, Marva Solomon, Angelo State University, mentor Wanda Brooks. Sylvia Nogaran Lu, University of Georgia, whose mentors were Pat and Ciso. Please stand, Pat. <laughs> and Marjorie Oriana Faustic. Zitlali Morales, University of Illinois at Chicago, mentor Kathy Hinchman. The fourth cohort, the current cohort, Mary McGriff from New Jersey City University, mentors Tanya Perry and Yolanda Silly Ruiz. Please stand, Tanya. Antonietta Avila from the University of Wisconsin, mentor Aria Rasfar. Monica Yu, University of Colorado at Colorado Springs, mentor Allison Skerritt. Wang Kong Wang Song, Arizona State University, mentors Yuri, Yuridis Bauer and Milidis Gort. Maria Salina Protasio, Western Michigan University, mentor Robert Jimenez. And Soria Colomar, University of South Florida, mentor Maria Franchi. I guess there were too many names for everyone to stand. Everyone that stood, please stand again and let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. So I apologize if I omitted or overlooked anyone. Um, the STAR mentoring program is a remarkable accomplishment for our organization, and several people have been involved in sustaining its success, including the STAR fellows, mentors, members of the Ethnicity, Race, and Multilingualism Committee, the Executive Committee, and the Board of Directors. I can say firsthand that this program made a significant difference in shaping my career within LRA and within the field. The STAR program is one way that our organization articulates a mission toward inclusion and diversity. So thank you for your continued success, uh, support and commitment. The call for applications for the next cohort will be available in February. So please encourage new literacy scholars of color especially men, as you probably noticed, there were, weren't any male, uh, male fellows, but please encourage them to apply. And lastly, I'd like to invite you to learn more about the program and the scholarship of the current cohort at an alternative roundtable session, which will be held on Friday, December 5th, 845 to 1015 in the Island Ballroom Salon F. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcel. We will look forward to that, those presentations on Friday. It is now my pleasure to introduce Misty Sailors, a current board member who will do the introduction of our president. Thank you, Janice. I am very excited to have been asked to introduce Dr. Arlette Ingram Willis, the current president of our organization, LRA. Here's some things you might already know about Arlette, but they're worth saying. She's a professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction, the Division of Language and Literacy. She's published 65 peer-reviewed articles and chapters and five books. She served as the co-editor of AERJ, the Teaching, Learning, and Human Development section, she served as the president of the National Conference on Research in Language and Literacy, and Dr. Willis has won numerous awards for her teaching and her research. Here are some things you may not know about Arlette. She loves Starbucks. <laughs> she loves Starbucks so much, in fact, she named her two sweet little dogs Star 
and box. <laughs> she does Tai Chi, and when she watches television, she keeps herself busy by crocheting and knitting. She has three sons, two grandsons, and two more grandchildren on the way, one of which could be born any day now, maybe now as we speak. Rumor has it that when Arlette was in high school, she was a gymnast. And when she was in college at Kent State, she was a cheerleader. But that rumor is still yet unconfirmed. <laughs> Dr. Willis is extremely committed to her own growth as a professional and as a person. In fact, this past spring, she traveled to Brazil to study the ways in which the works of Paulo Freire are being implemented in Brazilian universities. Dr. Willis is not only a scholar extraordinaire, she has a reputation for her undying support and sponsorship of beginning scholars. In fact, one of my colleagues started his career at Illinois, and although he has moved to UTSA, Dr. Willis continues to mentor him. And like most of you, I first came to know Arlette through her work. Her work in critically conscious research and multicultural education has guided my work as a teacher educator since I first came into academia. Dr. Willis is deeply committed to issues of social justice. Her scholarship encourages us to contextualize classroom practice within the socio-political and historical contexts of our communities. At the center of her work is the challenge for us to think critically about literacy and literacy education as a way of addressing educational inequities that exist within our communities, our schools, and our classrooms. Colleagues, will you please join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Arlette Ingram Willis. Wow. This is awesome to have the opportunity to look out among so many of my friends and colleagues. Thank you for attending, because I know the beach is right outside. <laughs> As LRA president, I want to extend a warm welcome to the 64th Annual Conference of the Literacy Research Association. President-elect and co-chair, Janice L. Macy has done an outstanding job of securing this wonderful site and planning an intellectually stimulating conference. Thank you, Janice, and Vice President and Co-Chair Patricia Enciso for all the hard work you've put into preparing the program and this year's conference. We are so very glad to have secured this lovely venue for you to share your research, engage in thought-provoking dialogue, and connect with colleagues. Thank you, Misty. I'm not really sure where you got that insider information, but I do have dogs, star, and bucks. As president, it's my job now to present my presentation. Ready? If you feel like that's what you want to do, bring me down. Can't none bring me down. Can love us too. Bring me down. Can't none bring me down. I said, bring me down. Thank you. That was really just to check the audio. <laughs> and to make sure the technology was working. Okay. The title of my talk is Literacy and Race, Access, Equity, and Freedom. You might be thinking, why race? Because why literacy is pretty obvious, right? That's why we're here. But why race at a literacy conference? Public discussions about race can be iffy and unpopular, as well as awkward, at an academic conference, so why race? My answer is, why not race? Especially as this nation very noticeably has failed to adequately celebrate the 60th anniversary of the 1954 
U.S. Supreme Court ruling in the Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, and the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Civil Rights Act in 1964. So therefore, it is important to discuss how race and how these two landmark decisions evolved to assure that the circumstances from which they emerged are not repeated. I can say with some certainty that the passage of both are huge factors in my life and part of the reason that I'm able to stand before you today. In all of my research, as Misty noted, I take a very critical stance. I like to challenge the status quo by critically analyzing the assumptions that underline the questions asked and unasked, the methods used, the outcomes, and the interpretation of the outcomes. I want to demystify the history of literacy in the United States and current events. These retellings happen to be more factually accurate and offer a more complex and nuanced understanding of literacy access, equity, and freedom. In this talk, I will share three interconnected stories. They're personal narratives, actually, from my journey as a literacy researcher. I begin the talk with a counter-narrative drawn from my family, but one that represents a very common literacy life story in millions of African Americans and other minoritized groups that rebuts the single story so often used in the media by politicians and sadly by some educational researchers that characterizes and pathologizes all African Americans and racialized groups in a single monolithic community, one that's uninterested in learning and in this talk, in literacy. Moreover, it makes clear that unequal access and opportunities creates unequal results. Okay. My first narrative begins, okay, thank you, in Northeastern Ohio, where I grew up, actually less than an hour away from Janice. All right. I like to characterize my early life as pretty traditional for someone who grew up in the 60s. In our neighborhood, everyone owned their own homes. Our neighbors were black and white. The children walked to school. Dads went to work. Mom stayed at home with the children. Clothes were washed on Monday and hung on the line. Wednesdays and Sundays, everyone went to church. Our neighborhood consisted of families with and without children. My family was slightly larger. We had five children, my four brothers and me. And like many African-American friends and neighbors, my parents had been part of the Great Migration North. Thus, every summer, and I do mean every summer, besides the annual, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we would make an annual trip to Niagara Falls to see the signs, if you will, of the wonders of nature. We also made an annual trip to visit my maternal grandparents in Montgomery, Alabama. Well, they like to say they lived in Montgomery, but they actually lived 12 miles outside of the city. But that was considered the country, and they didn't want to take on that. So they said they lived in Montgomery. They lived on hundreds of acres of land that my grandfather used to farm and other sections that he actually used as a recreational park for the people from the city of Montgomery, generally African Americans. They could come there and relax. We often took the train, and I mean the old time trains with dining cars and sleeping berths. On occasions, though, we drove the family car, a series of station wagons without air conditioning, <laughs> making the 16 hour trip in one day, always one day. While traveling, we would stop, but only for gas and a bathroom break. There, too, we saw signs, similar to the ones on the screen. When we saw these signs, only and only if we were out of gas would we purchase gas. 
but we would not drink from the water fountains or use the bathroom facilities, preferring thirst over humiliation and to go, if needed, later in a more hospitable place. As a young child and someone who grew up in a world where racism was not so overt, the signs were a shock and an ever-present reminder of racism in our country. We also learned how to navigate the scene the seen and unseen racism of the South. One of the stories that my family liked to share was when my Aunt Doris attended Calhoun Colored School. And Calhoun had buildings and grounds, which were a vast improvement over the ramshackled one-room schoolhouses that were available to most African Americans in the rural South. Calhoun had a campus and a number of buildings, a principal's home, classrooms, workshops, a cafeteria, a library. There were male and female dorms. And people could live on campus and work in an early version of a work-study program to pay their tuition. My family's memories and stories of life and schooling at Calhoun were treasured. But they were far from the stark realities of the school's history and founding. In my review of the ideologies that framed Calhoun, I uncovered a strategic and well-planned program to limit the education offered to African Americans with a clear purpose to keep a ready and peaceful workforce for Southern whites. A close look at schooling at Calhoun serves as a microcosm of how literacy and race have functioned as silent partners in access to educational equity. And a close examination of the quality of literacy provided at Calhoun suggests that the approach to literacy education undertaken by the founders, as well as the investors, was part of a larger and grander plan. The founders arrived in 1892, Charlotte Thorne, pictured on the screen, and her co-founder, Mabel Dillingham. Neither was an educator. They had received private educations and, had did, and did not have former school um, teacher training. They brought with them four female teachers from Hampton Institute, along with two male teachers for vocations. Their innocent dream of establishing a school required donations and investments by wealthy investors from the North. Thorne, a former socialite, had many friends and investors willing to help. In Dillingham, a minister's daughter used her influence to create missionary venues for funding. Thorne also used monetary donations to invest in stocks, to purchase school supplies, and to acquire more acreage for the school's vocation, primarily farming. A strategy used by the, farmers to, uh, the founders to solicit funding, both material and monetary, was to write passionate, descriptive editorials detailing the living conditions of African Americans in the community and the school. In their writings, they also shared photos of students, mostly smiling, chubby-faced young African Americans in tattered clothes against the backdrop of unkept land, so as to engender support for the school. However, the majority of the students in the school were actually young adults between the ages of 15 and 30. The founders implemented a popular approach to teaching used in the South called the Hampton-Tuskegee model. The model grew out of the work and the missionary, um, the work, I'm sorry, of Samuel Armstrong's American Missionary Association. Armstrong had conducted similar experiments among other racialized groups, Native Americans and indigenous Pacific Islanders, inhabitants of the state of Hawaii. And his thinking coincided with southern white congressional leaders that did not wish to extend equal education to southern blacks. The Hampton-Tuskegee model in the rural south centered on assimilating slaves, former slaves, and the children of former slaves into white southern society, not to fully participate as equal citizens or to upset the economics of the region, but to accept their fate as second-class citizens. 
In terms of literacy instruction, reading and writing were taught separately at Calhoun. Reading instruction in the early days was an endless series of drills over letters and sounds, as well as expressive oral reading. Does that sound familiar? And writing instruction consist, consisted of copying text from the board or books, as well as writing from oral dictation. As the years progressed, the founders were able to hire formally trained white and African American school teachers and to modernize their methods of teaching literacy. My Aunt Doris attended Calhoun in the late 1930s, shortly before the school was transferred to the state of Alabama. Roll Tide. I'm just saying. My, by contrast, my mom and her younger siblings did not attend Calhoun, in large part because my grandfather fought and successfully won the right for his children to ride the public school bus to nearby African American schools. Perhaps this is where I get my sense of fairness and the need to continually fight against racism and social as well as educational injustice. This story is not unlike those of many African Americans. In 1996, with funding from the Spencer Foundation and the University of Illinois, I interviewed several former Calhoun students. The oldest was Mrs. Leona Davis Lee, who at 104 sang to me songs that she had learned in her early days at Calhoun. In addition, I interviewed seven other seniors, and they all shared really pleasant memories of their days in Calhoun. This ends my first narrative. I've shared this story because access to education was extremely limited for African Americans for nearly 300 years prior to the founding of Calhoun. Throughout the nation, state laws had forbidden the teaching of reading and writing to slaves, and Jim Crow laws continued racially discriminatory practices after slavery ended. The narrative is an example of how literacy and race factored into access for literacy during the post-Reconstruction era and into the early years of the 20th century. The story is important because it reveals striking precedents to several current schooling practices in the US. Literacy and equity. For my second narrative, I also want to return to the notion of social historic context because it helps to frame my understanding of contemporaneous literacy research. Here is a photo of Linda Brown and her sister Terry, who had to walk to school over the railroad tracks and not to the nearby school, which was a whites only school in their neighborhood. In 1954, the US Supreme Court unanimously passed Brown v. the Board of Education where the judges ruled that the 14th Amendment, specifically the Equal Protection Clause, was in violation. They wrote, and I quote, in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate facilities are inherently unequal. 10 years later, President Johnson had declared war, a war on poverty, followed by his signing of the Civil Rights Act that effectively struck down Jim Crow laws and issued in human and civil rights for all US citizens. President Johnson, a former school teacher, believed, and I quote, equal access to education was vital to a child's ability to lead a productive life. Thus, he also signed the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which states, equal access to education sets high standards for academic performance and demands rigorous, a rigorous level of accountability for schools and districts. My second story begins with me in the first grade, decades after the 1928 Morford and Washburn study in the wealthy suburb of Winnetka, Illinois, that set the standard for six-year-olds to learn to read in first grade. Like all children in my school district, I walked to school with three of those four brothers. I lived on 4th Street. The school was on 5th Street. Can you go back to the next one? That's OK. Um, and I went to Jefferson Elementary School. 
Can you locate me on that photo? In my class, there were lots of children whose home language was not standard English. My peers spoke at home, French, Italian, Polish, and African American vernaculars. And we all learned to read and write under Mrs. Carter's watchful eyes. So to have you found me yet? Nope. Top row. In the middle. That's when I was considered tall. <laughs> Mrs. Carter was an exceptional teacher. She taught all 32 of us. She taught us to read and to write. And perhaps more importantly, she taught us to believe in ourselves as learners. I recall how excited my parents were to learn that I had a black teacher, the only one in our school. They believed that she would care for me and my education in ways that they were not certain white teachers would. So here I am on the last day of first grade with Mrs. Carter. <laughs> I still cannot figure out why my mother made me wear that dress in those white and patent leather shoes. This was the day of the all school picnic. She knew I wanted to compete, but I digress. Though Mrs. Carter was seldom absent, when she was, our substitute was Mrs. Blakely, another African-American teacher. Mrs. Blakely and her family, however, attended our church. And I was in Sunday school class with her daughter. So when Mrs. Blakely came, I knew I had to be on my very, very best behavior. If not, my parents would receive a call before I walked from 5th Street to 4th Street and my mother would learn all about my misbehavior, which was really not. I wasn't a bad student, but I loved to talk, and I was a bit of a bossy pants, not gonna lie. Mrs. Carter <coughs> taught reading using direct instruction and combined basal and phonics approaches to beginning reading. It seemed as if the entire morning of every school day was filled with a reading-related activity. We used the basal reading series complete with its white, middle-class nuclear family, mother, father, Alice, Jerry, baby Susan, and their dog, Jip. Our textbooks never, never had families of color. In our city, there was a strong support for public schools. Most of the children in my first grade class were my classmates for 12 years. We all graduated from high school, and 97% of us went on to four-year colleges. Mrs. Carter was a caring teacher who was also demanding and one who held high standards and expectations for us all. As countless research studies have shown, minoritized youth are most successful under teachers that embody these traits. I, share, I have shared the story of my first great year because it reveals the importance of community support for local public schools and the difference such support can make in the lives of all students. I've also shared this story because it highlights the importance of class of certified classroom teachers like Mrs. Carter. I've shared this story because it illustrates that when students have equal access and equal opportunities, everyone benefits. Finally, I've shared this story because it serves to foreground the importance that Congress has placed on beginning reading instruction. It seems to be a near, a near obsession with Congress because they historically want to find the best method of teaching reading without, however, seeking to address the social and economic inequalities that give, that give rise to unequal educational outcomes. Take, for example, the spring of 1964, pre-conference to the first grade studies. These reading researchers mentioned their interest in understanding the social, social economic status of communities, the demographics of the students, age, gender, race, ethnicity, and preschool experience, as well as seeking to determine the best approach to beginning reading. The committee's final report, however, ignored issues of community, class, 
race, and gender, as well as their effect on beginning reading instruction. Jean Chawl, in 1967, pointed out that selective research proposals that clearly identified racialized students, students who were Spanish dominant, and students who attend, attended under-resourced schools were eliminated from their analyses. So not too surprisingly, the final research report characterized US school children and beginning readers as white, six-year-old, middle-class, English-dominant students. The authors of the study also concluded that no single program of teaching beginning reading was superior to another without adequately addressing and failing to call into question the communities and student demographics. So let's fast forward to 1995. I'm sure all of you have heard of the Hart and Risley study. Often cited for its study of vocabulary development among young children, claiming, and it depends on who you listen to in terms of the claim, that African-American three-year-olds have a vocabulary of slightly more than 500 words, and white three-year-olds have a vocabulary of slightly more than 1,100 words. Or, and this is a more recent change in how the study is described, the vocabulary development of children living in welfare and working class environments differs from the vocabulary development of children whose parents are professionals. Kurt Dudley Marling and Lucas, 2010, have done a fabulous job of deconstructing the serious flaws in the study, from examining the assumptions to the interpretations. So I won't repeat them here. But I will say the results of the study painted with broad brushstrokes racial differences, while seriously minimalizing the economic and social differences between professional whites and welfare, whatever that is, African Americans, it's a practice that really, really bothers me. Susan Etlanger suggests we must challenge all such research by asking, did the data really show us this, or does the result make us feel more successful and more comfortable? I use the Dudley Marlene Lucas article in my classes, and a couple of years ago, I had a student she had not been a teacher education student at the University of Illinois. She graduated with a degree in English. However, she had participated in Teach for America in the Mississippi Delta. And she had taught, strangely enough, first grade while she was there. She confided that the Hart and Risley study, at least at that time, was the Teach for America Bible. And not only had she believed the results, but she had served as a trainer to prepare other Teach for America candidates. As a result of reading the article, she sent a copy to her former Teach for America supervisors. I was proud of her for making that very bold move. I can't say that it made a difference, but I can say that in this young woman, it made a difference. She would read from now on research very differently and she would think about notions of racial differences cited in research very differently. On to 1998, much like the first grade studies, in 1998, Congress made a similar request of educational researchers to determine the best features of beginning reading instruction. From this request came Preventing Reading Difficulties, a study by Snow, Burns, and Griffin. And like the earlier reading studies, Descriptions of U.S. school children rarely inclu included descriptions of race, class, gender, or community. A third study, the National Reading Panel Report, was commissioned by Congress, including another request to specifically identify demographics about school children and their early reading progress. Collectively, these three studies, the Hart and Risley study, Preventing Reading Difficulties, and the National Reading Panel Report all served as a catalyst for the claims of a reading, of a literacy crisis, sorry. 
I want to hover over the alphabetic section, which is the first sub-report of the National Reading Panel Report. Looking closely at that first sub-report, my graduate students and I focused only on the studies conducted in the United States. And we reanalyzed the data using discourse analysis, not the meta-analysis used in the original report. And what we found was pretty surprising. There were more students unaccounted for than could be accounted for. There were relatively few studies with African American students and even fewer studies with other minoritized students. Consistently, students identified as predominantly Spanish speaking were removed from consideration in the studies. And Asian American students were presumed to be English dominant. All students, in terms of social class status, were mentioned, but it wasn't an, an integral part of the stated analysis. In sum, the most identifiable students were white, upper middle class, and English dominant, hardly a representative picture of US school children. Thus, we were outraged when we viewed a video that claimed, and the next when children fail to learn to read, this downward spiraling continues until children avoid reading and develop a sense of failure that affects all aspects of their lives. In this video scene, you can see that there are a few young black and brown boys in a city under a viaduct in front of a trash bin with a subway car in the background. The voiceover that I just shared with you is not supported in the studies reviewed. It's not supported in the data in the studies. Given the relative, relatively limited number of African Americans and Latino students in the first subgroup report, the lack of accounting for students who lived in poverty and who attended under-resourced under schools, we were concerned then that the massive calls for an overhaul and, to, and the uh, need to rethink beginning reading instruction was being based on unacknowledged assumptions, especially as noted in this video, that victimized these young men using deficit language in a manner not substantiated by the data. We wonder why the producers of the video which is different from the authors of the study, the National Reading Panel Report, and different from the authors of the original studies and the meta-analysis. This is the producers of the video. We wonder why they chose that scene and why they used that voiceover. Because black and brown male students were not identified in the studies in sufficient numbers to draw this conclusion or to profile these children. In our opinion, the producers of the video had moved beyond the data. Now, we presented these findings at three literacy conferences. But just try to get that kind of critical research published. I'm just saying, I'm a little bitter. Nonetheless, the results of the alphabetic subsection on beginning reading instruction were hailed as the panacea, that silver bullet that people have been looking for to help children who were failing to be to learn to read in first grade. In addition, many of the promotional materials, much like those in the Cal, used by the founders of Calhoun Colored School, use the faces of black and brown children to draw public support. The seeming error in the video is merely symptomatic of how reading research results have been characterized. Let's take, for example, the alleged representative sample of U.S. school children in NAEP. For me, what, what NAEP consistently makes unclear is where these children come from. They mention the states, but not the school districts. They mention geographical locations like rural, urban, and suburban, but you don't know where the children are and which locations they're coming from. I don't think it's a very inclusive set of national, a national report card. 
The NAEP reading tests have reported and ranked results by comparisons of aggregate racial groups, nevertheless. Specifically, the two largest, until recently, racial groups in the US, whites and African Americans, and now Latino Latinos, students. Too often, the interpretation of the reading results pathologizes the students, their families, their schools, and communities, while simultaneously ignoring the social and economic inequalities and the assumptions on, upon which standardized reading tests are based. Believer, uh, supporters of the No Child Left Behind Act through, believe that through annual testing, they would find that students would improve. Well, we know that hasn't really happened. So we looked at the 2013 NAEP data. This was 92,000 high school seniors. These are people who had been part of No Child Left Behind from the day they entered school. And what you'll find that in the realm of proficient readers, it ranges from 16 to 47%. Those at the high end are white students and Asian, Asian Pacific Islanders. Those at the low end are black, Hispanic, American, Indian, Native Alaskan, and multiracial students. What we know is that No Child Left Behind Act has failed to deliver proficient readers by 2014, because it's still 2014. I don't think it's gonna happen in the next few weeks. <laughs> we can see from the screen that the reading scores have actually declined since 1992 and remained steady since 2009. So given what I know about educational testing and the history thereof and reading testing, I have to drop on Albert Einstein, who says that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Literacy research that fails to acknowledge the reasons for economic and social inequality helps to maintain dominant ideologies and normative practices that disproportionately benefit certain groups. What reading research has shown consistently is that well-prepared classroom teachers in school districts that support public schooling can have a profound and lasting effect on a, children, on a child's ability to read and write. Okay. Literacy and race, freedom. So let's fast forward to this century. Amid the social historic background of the first decade of this century, we have seen an attack on the US, shores in 9-11, US troops fighting seemly, seemingly endless wars in the Middle East, the collapse of the economy in large part due to risky hedge fund investors, the first African American US president and considerable changes in the aftermath of the implementation of No Child Left Behind. But what we haven't seen are, are real changes in reading achievement. My final narrative begins this semester when I received an email from an intellectually curious undergraduate teacher education student who wrote, I was working with a business major who brought his application to Stanford Business. His future goal is to get involved in, in an education fund. When I asked him about what that entailed, he explained that these funds buy failing public schools and then run them as a business, fixing them. When I asked if this was essentially privatizing education, he said it basically was. Then she asked me in her email, in this is this process related or similar at all to how charter schools work? She goes on to write, as if answering her own question, I definitely don't know much about this, but to me it sounds like the businessmen who are largely not trained in education slash teaching, have no educational work experience, come in and buy schools to profit and further their business. I told you she was smart. At face value, this sounds like a horrible ideal to me. When I asked him how common this was, he said it's becoming very common in California. She concludes by writing, 
I'd love to hear more about it because as someone who's actually studying education, some of what this student said to me about education was kind of alarming. My quick email response at 935 at night was to refer the student to Barbara Miner's 2010 article entitled Superpower colon Supersized Dollars Drive Agenda. But as a teacher educator, I felt that I needed to offer the student more current information about charter schools and charter school funding. Recall that the No Child Left Behind Act included the charter school program, which was actually an extension of the original 1965 ESA Act and the second extension in 1998. Specifically, the charter school program under No Child Left Behind was implemented, and I quote, to provide support for planning, program design, and initial implementation of charter schools, and is intended to enhance parent and student choices among public schools and give more students the opportunity to learn challenging standards. The guidelines for non-regulatory support of the charter school program under Title V Part B of the No Child Left Behind Act has been severely ramped up under the Obama administration's use of waivers and its implementation of race to the top competitions in what's known as an educational marketplace. First, we'll take a look at charter schools, followed by a brief discussion of the linkages among race to the top, funding, the Common Core State Standards, and the National Council on Teacher Quality. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This table depicts the growing number of U.S. students enrolled in public charter schools. Currently, the number of students enrolled has increased from 1.8 million in 2000 to over 2.1 million in 2011. The notion of parents slash caregivers selecting the most appropriate schooling option for students today is referred to as freedom of choice. The same ideal can easily be called privatizing and corporatizing education. The current use of charter schools is an outstanding example of Gary or Orfield's notion of stratified opportunities. Most charter schools are public schools and they use taxpayer money to support them as alternatives to traditional public schools. Charter schools, however, can take a variety of forms. They can be public or private, not-for-profit, or for profit, cyber or online charter schools, secular slash inspirational, religious inspired, co-ed, or single gendered. The media is filled with many emotionally latent responses to successful charter, charter school experiences that have greatly increased the desire for charter school education. These success stories have also spurred the funneling of public tax dollars to pay for charter schools. The real question for this conversation is whether or not charter schools offer a superior reading program. What does research search tell us about the reading achievement of students attending charter schools? That is, do they perform equally well, if not better than their peers in traditional public schools? What research reveals is that for some students, yes, a charter school reading program appears better than their peers in traditional public schools if you gauge reading achievement by test score performance. Students, for example, who attended public schools in under-resourced communities but now attend public not-for-profit charter schools have made some gains in reading achievement but have only slightly been successful in closing the reading achievement gap. Relatedly, results of different student groups indicate that black students, students in poverty, and English language learners benefit from attending charter schools. However, charter school quality is uneven across the states and across the schools. These findings are supported by a number of related analyses by the Stanford Credo Group. Drawing on the Credo Group, you will note that the majority of charter schools are in urban areas. A few years ago, I consulted with a large metropolitan school district and worked with the principals and the English language arts teachers to improve literacy education in those schools. Entering one school, 
I was unprepared to find that the teachers had not arrived on time. A school library without books and bathrooms without toilet paper. I can clearly see where a charter school where teachers arrive on time with a school library that has books and bathroom facilities that are well stocked is an improvement over public schools in the same communities. However, I don't believe that it's the charter nature of the schools that is making the difference. What I do understand is that in some communities, the charter school curriculum is not superior, but it is consistent. Not all charter schools, however, have received, been well received in their communities. For example, recently there's been media reports of taxpayers supported charter schools that offer what some consider to be religious or religious inspired education. As revealed in a recent examination of the 146 inspired schools by Turkish Iman Fatula Gulin. Since the onset of the investigation of several of the charter schools, they've either closed or they've been privatized. There are other news reports, some you may not hear as often, of charter schools because of fraud. There's a lot of money to be made. So among the 6,000 charter schools in the US, this year there have been FBI raids in Connecticut, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida, and Louisiana, where the FBI has confiscated reams of documents that include the use of uncertified teachers, failing test data, falsified test data, and the evidence of the misuse of public funds. A closer look at a not so worthy predatory profiteer in charter schools makes the point. In North Carolina, for example, there's a charter school with only 35 students, one third of what the state requires. The school has been identified as a not-for-profit charter school. However, profits are clearly being made. The investor to whom the charter school was granted, allegedly, rented the books, the buildings, the chairs, the computers, the desk, etc., from his own companies. And he pays his son, someone who is not credentialed, someone who is not an educator, a very handsome six-figure salary, monies that people have believed were being spent to educate students who were living in poverty, who had attended under-resourced public schools, were now lining the pockets and increasing the bottom line in bank accounts of a billionaire who has profited over $19.4 million from his charter school investments over the last six years. Notably, there are striking similarities between the efforts of the founders of Calhoun and current education reforms. Many charter schools are established by people without degrees in education or education-related fields. Many charter schools permit, are permitted to hire teachers who are not certified. Influential investors are directing the course of education in charter schools. Often, the target school populations are from urban, low-income, African-American communities. The after-school programs in many charter schools reflect strong religious beliefs. Charter schools, many are, designed to build a better workforce. Finally, let's take a look at the links among charter schools, Teach for America, Common Core, and the National Council on Teacher Quality. I'm bemused. Thank you by the connections between and among the financial investors and supporters of the privatization and corporatization of charter schools and education reforms. To me, the handwriting for all of us is on the wall. The push behind NT, NCTQ is a prelude to seeking to dismantle teacher education programs in colleges and universities and replace them with schools of education created and promoted by the same profiteering corporate sponsors and investors. As if 
as if, uh, as if in anticipation of a backlash, wealthy investors and supporters of charter schools and the Common Core state standards have also been using their wealth and influence to support the political campaigns of select politicians and those seeking appointments on local school boards. Nonetheless, it has been, there has been a growing um, grassroots backlash from groups that don't generally agree with one another. They've, there's been a backlash to the Common Core state standards because some people believe that there is an over-reliance on standardized testing. And some people believe it offers a restrictive curriculum. Opponents are arguing that the tie-in between the race to the top monies and the use of the Common Court standards is a violation of the Tenth Amendment. It's a great idea, but it's a long shot. There's yet to be a case won by depending on the Tenth Amendment as a defense. What I find far more intriguing and uncanny is the following link. In 1653, African slaves, at the direction of Dutch slaveholders, built Wall Street. Yes, indeed, I'm talking about the Wall Street of New York City. And where investors auctioned, bought, sold, and rented men, women, and children to increase their economic profits. Now, over 350 years later, on the same site, Hedge fund investors are investing the monies of profiteering wealthy men, women, and corporations who are willingly auctioning, buying, selling, and renting the lives of predominantly poor and working class black and brown children's educational futures on Wall Street. Some in the form of mass media campaigns to convince the public and politicians that traditional public schools are failing some in the form of the corporatization and privatization of education, some in the form of calls for additional standardized testing, and still others in the form of calls to restructure teacher education. The history of reading testing indicates that the tests were never designed to equalize economic, educational, or social inequalities. If anything, standardized reading tests points to the stratification within our nation. Perhaps that is why, in 2014, there are over 800 colleges and universities that no longer depend on the SAT scores or their equivalents for admissions, because research has shown that no statistical differences exist between college freshmen who have and who have not scored well on the SAT or their equivalents. So in conclusion, I've described literacy access through a narrative of the social historic context of African Americans attending Calhoun Colored School. I've examined literacy equity through a narrative of the unrealized hope and promise of Brown v. the Board and the Civil Rights Act in my review of the first grade studies, the National Reading Panel Report subgroup report on alphabetics, NAEP data, and the No Child Left Behind Act. And I have characterized literacy freedom through a narrative about the privatization and corporatization of education and reading achievement under Race to the Tops, expansion of charter schools, the Common Core State Standards, and the funding sources that support these reforms. I have documented historic and contemporaneous events that have influenced public education, but have not significantly changed reading achievement. So now that you're informed, you're being held responsible for change. As literacy researchers, we can individually and collectively be courageous and acknowledge the social historic context of reading. Be courageous and engage in critical discussions that point out economic, social, and racial inequalities in reading research and outcomes, and be courageous and challenge the current reform efforts by providing literacy research and strategies to support equitable literacy access and opportunities. 
we can make a difference. Misty shared with you I have two grandsons. My oldest grandson is Bo. He's a precocious five-year-old. And when he really wants something from his parents but doesn't want to ask, he says, oh, someday I wish to have. <laughs> Thus, I end this talk by stating that someday I wish that literacy, access, equity, and freedom be extended to all learners. Thank you. Challenging our thinking and for all of your service to the organization. Please join us outside on the Sunset Terrace for a reception honoring Arlette and all of our past presidents. <laughs>